Tomorrow is my birthday, and so today I'm going to give you my first themed episode, and in this case the theme is Books That Shaped Me. You better buckle up. Nah, it's actually pretty tame. Before I begin this video, it probably would make sense to tell you that both of my parents were public educators throughout much of their lives. I was raised by parents who had a massive picture book collection of their own before my brother and I even arrived on the scene. I come by it honestly. The first book I ever remember hearing read to me was The Maggie Bee by Irene Hass. It still has my mom's name in the front because she probably used it in the classroom. And yes, I kind of stole it. Don't tell her, my mom. Margaret Barnstable is a little girl that wishes on the North Star one night for her very own ship for one day, and that someone nice for company would come along with her. The next day she wakes up on her own little ship called the Maggie B, and her baby brother James is there for her to take care of and to enjoy. She also seems to have a menagerie, a garden, a place to paint and all the stuff to paint with, fishing nets, a full kitchen, Basically, she has everything I want in an apartment to this day, except I would probably want a little more square footage. Margaret takes really good care of baby James, all the animals, saves the ship from possibly being wrecked by a major storm. I adore this book. I wish this was still in print. Really, it was the first feminist statement I ever came across, that you can have autonomy, you can have a beautiful place that is all your own, and you can have community there. I'm still boggled by how perfect this book is. Next, we have The Spooky Old Tree by Stan and Jan Berenstein. Are there any other Berenstein Bear folks out there? The Spooky Old Tree is about three bear siblings that decide to go on a little adventure in the dark. The book constantly asks, do they dare? Yes, they dare. One by one, the bears start to get really, really freaked out by what they find. And by the end, they feel a need to flee from a large and rather less friendly bear. I love the idea of having an adventure in your own backyard. When I was a kid, we went camping in my backyard. We did everything in my massive backyard. We never did anything quite as fun as what you find in this book, but we were also probably not the bravest of children, not gonna lie. I also realized as I was getting ready for this video, this particular color palette has stuck with me my whole life. This is still basically my ideal world. It kind of even matches this dress. Now we come to Madeline. Madeline is one of my favorite books of all time. It's a classic. I used to get a lot of requests for it when I was working at a bookstore. I was always happy to give it to someone. This is actually a Madeline treasury I more recently picked up. Today I'm obviously talking about the original Madeline. In an old house in Paris that was covered in vines lived 12 little girls in two straight lines. The translations from the French are in perfect rhyme and meter. They are absolutely delightful. Vemelins points out that Madeline is the smallest, but also the bravest. To the tiger in the zoo, she just says, poo poo. There's a whole plot line in the first one about how Madeline has to go to the hospital and have an appendectomy. And all the other girls are sad because they want to have their appendix out. And at the end of the book, poor Miss Clavel is awoken from a sound sleep by the sound of crying. And it's all of the little girls saying, boo hoo, we want our appendix out too. Cry for attention much. My dad is the one that used to read this book to me all the time. He was a huge fan of Madeline. His good night greeting to me when I was a very little girl comes from the end of this book. I'm gonna include it at the end of this video. Stay tuned if you really wanna know what it was like to grow up in my house. Here is Anne Likes Red, written in 1965 by Dorothy Z. Seymour and illustrated by Nancy Meyerhoff. This is another special from my parents' classroom, specifically my mom. It was 59 cents back in the day. I mean, I'm not gonna lie, there's not much to this story. Anne and her mom go to the department store and Anne likes red. Red, red, red. I relate to this. I've always been attracted to way too much color. You may have noticed that. I remember being specifically enthused about Anne's red belt choice. I don't think I had ever seen a red belt at the time. I was like, I want a red belt. Girl buys a red dress, red belt, red sandals. It's amazing. Oh, and a freaking red hat. I still think this is one of the coolest outfits I may have ever seen. Everybody is going to try to give you the blue dress or they're going to try to give you the tan sandals. Who wants tan sandals? I don't want tan sandals. I love that Anne knows who she is. She sticks to her guns and she gets the best outfit in the world. Who can argue with that kind of self-knowledge? And then we have visiting the art museum. For all those 80s kids that grew up reading the Arthur books, like Arthur's Eyes, the author and illustrator of those books, Mark Brown, wrote this book with his wife, Laureen Krasny Brown. 
Yeah, as a kid, I did not beg for things. I was actually ludicrously well behaved. It's only in adulthood that I learned how to behave differently. This book, when I was about five years old, is the one thing I ever remember begging for my entire childhood or adolescence. The irony is our parents bought us a lot of books, so I probably wouldn't have had to beg for it. The thing is I flipped through it at the bookstore and there was one detail in particular that I could not live without. So every two page spread is actually one room of the museum. And one thing that the Browns did really, really well was they integrated illustration with photography from medieval Europe to the post impressionists to Picasso and Jackson Pollock. But this right here is the page that I couldn't walk away from. I think I would have been more intrigued a few years later by Klaus Oldenburg's stuffed cake over here. But when I was five years old, I saw this. Roy Lichtenstein's Wham! And all I could think was, a comic book can be art. A comic book can be art! I had to have this book because that was the first moment I got excited about art. The first moment I was ever inspired to become an artist. I owe the Browns a massive debt of gratitude for this particular book. And last but certainly not least, we have Yay You by Sandra Boynton. Anybody that knows me in real life knows that I am a little obsessive about Sandra Boynton. The woman is amazing. She's been publishing since I was a baby, I think. She's still publishing. I think she published four books last year. She's a freaking juggernaut of whimsy. I have her calendar right outside this door as we speak. It's delightful. This specific copy of this specific book, though, is important to me because it was my parents' gift to me the day I graduated from college. I mean, don't get me wrong. The book itself is absolutely delightful. In this case, my dad wrote me a letter. It recounts almost everything he remembers from my college years and tells me just how proud he was of me. And when I say a letter, I mean a letter. Today is the fourth anniversary of my dad's passing. I'm not gonna tell you about him because we'd be here all day. Suffice to say the man was all love. Physical books are not just cultural history, they're personal memory. In my arms, I have my childhood. I have the childhood of my parents' students. I have my father's words writ at length to me, lovingly and easily kept safe. I invite you to explore your earliest memories of books and see if any titles, themes, dreams stick with you to this day. I highly recommend buying picture books for people you love, children, adults, and writing them a good letter. You'll have no idea how much it can mean to somebody. Good night, little girl. Thank the Lord you are well. And now go to sleep, said Daddy Clavel. And he turned out the light and closed the door. And that's all there is. And there ain't no more. So, today is my birthday. And it's not just any birthday. It's my 42nd birthday. It is my Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy birthday. I'm not going to normally look at illustrated novels on this channel, but every once in a while, it's gonna be necessary. The Hitchhiker's Guide was written by our dearly departed Douglas Adams, one of the funniest writers of the late 20th century. I'm not gonna tell you much about this book. If you have not read it, you need to read it. And if you have read it, you need to read it again and in this edition. If you don't know this edition, this glorious, glorious edition that came out last year on the 42nd anniversary of The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. If the illustration style looks familiar to you, you may recognize it from a lot of Neil Gaiman's work. Chris Riddell writes his own books but also illustrates for a lot of different people and has done a ton of work with Neil Gaiman. Neil is even on the cover. Where isn't Neil? One of my favorite parts of The Hitchhiker's Guide comes in chapter seven. It involves a discussion of the worst poetry in the universe. Vogon poetry is, of course, the third worst in the universe. The second worst is that of Asgoths of Korea. We're not gonna get into that. The very worst poetry of all perished along with its creator, Paula Nancy Millstone Jennings of Greenbridge, Essex, England in the destruction of the planet Earth. Yes, it's a spoiler. If you haven't read it, the Earth is destroyed at the beginning of the novel to make way for a new intergalactic superhighway. Rather than telling you any more, I am simply going to read you some Vogon poetry and inflict you with some wonderful illustrations from Chris Friedell. Enjoy! Oh, fraddled Grant Bugley, thy micturations are to me as plurdled gaboblochets on a lurgid bee. Group, I implore thee, 
my Foontin turtle drums and hoopsiously drangle me with crinkly bindle whirls, or I will rend thee in the gobble warts with my blurgle crunching. See if I don't. Seriously, you need this edition. Go, go buy it now. Go, 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 go. I'm gonna go celebrate my birthday. See if I don't. Damn it, I forgot a towel. are great. Anzu the Great Kaiju by Benson Shum. Kaiju are Japanese monster films and the monsters in them are also referred to as kaiju. Godzilla is easily the most famous example. In this particular book every single kaiju is given a city to strike fear into the hearts of. The problem is, is that our friend Anzu was born with the power of flowers. Flowers as you may have heard are not particularly destructive. Every time Anzu uses his powers as he understands them his family goes a little nuts and you really don't want to make a kaiju go nuts. Instead of the people of Anzu City being upset about what he does, they love him. They have a good time. But his family remains unhappy. They call in the big guns, they call in grandma, and eventually Anzu succeeds, at least in the way that his family wants him to succeed. However, as it says in the book, a great kaiju should feel powerful and strong, but Anzu felt empty. So instead of continuing the expected path of a kaiju, Anzu heals his city with his powers instead. Eventually, Anzu is able to say to his family, I may not strike fear like a great kaiju, but I am a good kaiju. And that's when his family tells him that they have realized that he is an extraordinary kaiju. Also, I just love the family portraits page in the back. Benson Shum, this is rad. This is in some ways an incredibly adorable story. I believe it's also potentially a very powerful story for all of us about owning your truth, owning your superpowers. Even when they're not the powers that your family expect, your friends, your culture, you've got to go with who you are. How often are we still told as adults that we have to conform to be great? Are we immune to family pressure as adults? It takes him a minute, but it really does not take Anzu long to understand how beautiful and important his powers are. It's the people around him that take much longer. Not all families or friends will react in the way that Anzu's family reacts, but we don't really have a shot of being accepted for who we truly are unless we stand up and say, this is me and I love me. Benson Shum is an LA area author illustrator, and he also works for Disney as an animator. And I can tell he's been doing some really, really fun work, has a couple of his own picture books out. He has a wonderful board book called Little Seed that just came out last year as well. I really enjoy storybooks illustrated by animators or by people who have taken the principles of animation into illustration. As an animation nerd, I still really enjoy line defined shapes. You also have some really great examples of strong line of action through the figures so that the movement is really powerful and pops. There's also a principle in animation called squash and stretch. The idea is that an object has to squish down and then lengthen as it sort of bounces through space. It maintains the implied volume of a character or an object. While these animation principles are certainly not mandatory for all illustration, just look at the kind of things I like. I like a very broad range of illustration style. It is really exciting when you see it because it really gives a sense of dynamic movement and strong characterization. I was also able to pick up the most adorable Anzu tote bag at a store called Once Upon a Time in Montrose, California. If you're ever in the LA Glendale-ish area, it is the oldest children's book store in America and Benson Shum's stuff is everywhere there. I even hear there's an Anzu sequel coming and as an Anzu fangirl, can't wait. So you go forth and be the best kaiju you can possibly be. The picture is always bigger. Two Worlds Above and Below the Sea by David Duvalet. I do not collect a ton of nature photography, but I definitely have a small, and if I do say so, beautiful collection of it on my bookshelf. For those beginning a collection of nature photography, I cannot recommend this book highly enough. It is absolutely gorgeous, but it is also a really manageable size. A lot of books devoted to this kind of subject actually end up a lot bigger than this. I ended up buying this at my local bookstore when I was working there because it caught my eye on a display. and I think Dubolet has spent the last 50 years specializing in underwater photography, although I've also seen some amazing examples of his work that are above the waterline. He often works with his photography partner and wife, marine biologist Jen Hayes. And at the time of this video, he has contributed at least 70 features to National Geographic magazine. As the title would suggest, there is not a single picture in this collection that does not include both what is happening above the surface and below it. As you have undoubtedly already seen, Dubly does an exceptional job of showing the diversity of the sea itself, the wildlife underneath it and above it, and of course, 
the other wildlife, us. He does an incredible job demonstrating how humanity and nature are not separate but one entity. That on a certain level we are all in fact nature. And he expertly chronicles how we can be at one with the rest of nature around us or the force of its destruction. We are not simply adjacent to the water. We are a part of it and it is a part of us. And our fate is a shared fate. Dubois considers his work and the work of other nature photographers as central to conservation efforts. Flipping through a book like this can help remind us what's at stake with the dire state of environmental news these days. It is really tempting to give in to the feeling that the sky has already fallen and that photography books like this are records of a world we are about to lose. That is a possibility and there is still time to act. Even if you keep one book of beautiful nature photography in your home, Keep it in a place that you can see it. Keep it in a place that invites you to flip through it. When we open up a book like this of such incredible beauty, it doesn't matter what age we are, we are taken back to that childlike state of wonder. Remember that yes, we are losing, but all is not yet lost. And there is still time. And there is still wonder. The picture is still bigger. I Love You Because I Love You, written by Monty Van and illustrated by Jessica Love. This book is easily one of my favorite books to be published this calendar year. It came out this last January. I was already well familiar with Van's work because of a book called Wishes. I almost think of it as a refugee story told through magical realism. The way that the illustrations and the text dance together is almost otherworldly. Meanwhile, I was also a massive fan of Jessica Love. She received many awards, including the Stonewall Award for Julian is a Mermaid. Julian is arguably the first picture book protagonist who is genderqueer, gender creative, gender fluid. We will definitely be talking about Julian at some other point. And just this last week, I saw this brand new re-illustrated edition of Will It Be Okay? A classic from 1977 by Crescent Dragon Wagon. I really love love. <laughs> Back to I love you because I love you. Each two page spread is two sides of a relationship mirroring each other. I love you because you carry me. Because I love you, I am strong. I love you because you wait for me. Because I love you, you're never too late. I love you because you tell the best stories. Because I love you, my best story is you. Personally, this is my favorite spread. My first major art piece was called Red Crayon on Wall, circa 1984. My parents seemed pretty supportive about it until they moved a piano in front of it and sold the house. I love you because you let me make mistakes. Because I love you, no mistake is ever too great. I'm sure you've noticed by now that this book has a remarkably diverse array of human demographics. People of all kinds of genders and orientations and ethnicities are found in these pages. If we're talking about what's currently published in picture books, the most unusual spread is likely this one. I love you because we go together. Because I love you, we change and grow together. That is a really powerful example of what we call normalization. I can tell you as someone who worked in a bookstore, a lot of people will come in and say, for example, I need a book for my children about divorce. But I actually once had a customer who asked me for a book not about divorce, but about a family that happened to have divorced parents. She was hoping to normalize the experience of divorce for her children through a book that normalized it. So when marginalized communities have been kept out of view for so long in all different kinds of publishing, including picture books, Books. It is a huge deal not to just have a book about, say, a trans person, but it's also a massive deal to have a book that treats a trans person as any other person in a narrative. I could say in some ways this book is profoundly about gender, about orientation, about ethnicity, and in other ways I can say it is not about any of those things. Both of those things would be true simultaneously, and that's why this is so important. What the author and the illustrator are choosing to do is saying, all of these relationships, these families, these loves, these friends are legitimate and normal and everyday and common and remarkably beautiful. All of these people and all of these relationships are worthy. And it's also important to note all of the people pictured in these pages are members of Jessica Love's audience and their loves. She likes to sketch people on the subway. If you read Julian, that makes total sense. But this project happened during lockdown and she didn't have anyone to draw and didn't have any models to bring in. So she asked her Instagram audience to send her pictures of themselves and the people they love. And that's how we got this incredible catalog of such wonderful people. This book is beautiful and profound as a discussion of love between humans, but it is also one small and not insignificant act of justice. The maligned and the unseen are now seen and beloved. And because of incredible books like this, the picture is always bigger.